Yeah. Now, um, there were two speakers in the schedule, but unfortunately only one could make it. So please give a warm applause to Jaromil, who will talk about the future of money. sure to if I should claim the climax of this uh, movie or admit that the audio track one of them was missing anyway you just avoided you just save yourself from a spoiler this was the inside job and I think it's uh, it's a movie is a documentary worth seeing if you are concerned about the topic of this speech and uh, the topic of this speech actually links, or I hope to link it enough, to a discourse that is uh, flowing through this camp. Uh, in various other speeches, uh, you have heard uh, concerns about transition. It was uh, definitely worth uh, uh, attending to the transition telecom, I think, or watch the video later. There is another speech uh, coming up about the declaration of uh, cyberspace. There are a lot of topics brought up, and they are about constituency. So what I'm trying to do in this uh, talk is to actually see uh, the future of money or whatever can become uh, this infrastructure, this communication infrastructure for society, considering the fact that uh, we might be the community that establishes one of the first uh, uh, trans-territorial constituencies because that's the positioning of the hacker community nowadays. So my analysis, uh, our analysis, unfortunately Radium is not here, he's in uh, Portugal right now, he's uh, working with a partner for our project Stro, and um, he apologizes for not being able to come here and he sent a video of 15 minutes that I can show you at the end of uh, this, our, um, almost at the end of this talk, as much as you can be patient with it, as long as. And uh, the, the approach that we follow in this analysis is um, a philosophical one, and we try to make it interesting for hackers. I'm trying my best to explain um, first uh, uh, a bit of a uh, political and philosophical background and then go into technology. It's a hard task. 
And as you can see, I'm really emotional. And I, it's not my first talk, but it's the first time I'm so nervous in giving a talk here, actually. It's incredible. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so the method um, I'm, I'm adopting is, uh, is called the biopolitical method. I'm picking it up from uh, Michel Foucault. He's a, a researcher uh, definitely worth reading. He made uh, an analysis of uh, governmentality through the years and uh, of uh, liberalism of various situations. I will quote some of them. Um, one of the clues of his analysis is that he actually tries to build the history that has not been written. So what he calls genealogy is a research that is very detailed into the unspoken aural oral uh, materials that can reconstruct actually the history of uh, often what are the losers or the marginalized. What he also uh, researched in are institutions of discipline like um, mental institutes or jails. So he is concerned about margins, he's concerned about what actually fences off a society and his technique is that of researching micropowers, the micropowers that act beyond the, the curtain of an institution, and he does that by changing perspectives. The approach is also interdisciplinary, necessarily, because we should be all uh, looking at an interdisciplinary approach to this, to this topic, not just technical, not just philosophical. Merging the two, and in this I quote Latour, who wrote an interesting essay about symmetric anthropology. So the fact that we should start seeing any artifact, any object, any new discovery that we do as a hybrid, it will influence both the humanist, the society, and the technical field. So nothing is just into one or the other field. I'm here also uh, under suggestion of uh, Steph. My friend, he told me, like, you should restate again, as I did in a uh, previous speech uh, in uh, Barcelona, that capitalism is dead. I think it's, yeah, it's uh, pretty easy uh, to say it nowadays. I mean, I have a honor to say it now, and uh, you can uh, be joyful or not. Uh, uh, anyway, the, the point is that um, when, once capitalism is dead and we are running a dead horse and it's pretty clear by the numbers and we can just reiterate through failures and failures, one thing that we should do to understand what comes after is looking at why capitalism came in. So what is the history that brought capitalism in? So in pre-capitalist modes of production, so before capitalism came, the relation of uh, labor, I mean, I have also a joke to make about this. I mean, we could explain also that capitalism is dead just by um, a simple slide like this. Please note the date. <laughs> Yet, this is not the method that we follow. One, because it doesn't really um, open up a discourse about the future. And second, because it is a very historicistic approach. It is a materialistic approach. It is something pretty obvious nowadays, but it doesn't really add much to the discourse that we want to build. So, coming back to what I just started uh, illustrating, before capitalism came, we had a situation that Deleuze and Guattari, in their book Anti-Oedipus, define a code, a coded situation uh, for cultural, for the positioning of the subject in culture and in society. It means that uh, the subjectivity, what people recognize themselves in, cannot be separated from the social conditions of the subject in society, so that you are defined by uh, your provenience, by your family, your your class, in the worst case, your caste. So you're going to perpetuate, you have a relation of repetition with the context where you come from. So
So most of the time, you can imagine it, you will do the same job or you will be in the same social conditions of your parents. This was before capitalism came, and the main function of capitalism was that of breaking down the codes. In this was well accepted, and it was a very useful thing to, for instance, uh, bring down situations like caste systems. It basically established um, a relationship uh, that was completely quantitative between labor and capital. It permitted uh, our society to, to follow dreams, uh, the well-known American dream that everyone can be anything. You can become anyone. You have an open field, you have an open game, you can join it. The quantity of money that you have uh, the, the, the knowledge that you have of the world and the system in which you're playing is your horse and basically you can arrive everywhere. That is the promise. It did so using money as a main media. And money is a media, and it's, uh, it has been uh, claimed uh, as a neutral media since the beginning, because it is basically the measure of this quantitative relation. It's uh, positioning the man, the subject, uh, as an as a indirect being. This is a quote from uh, uh, Georg Simmel, from 1900, one of the most authoritative books on the philosophy of money. It puts man as an indirect being. Indirect because your uh, wishes, your desires, your possibility to reach them are conditioned by the quantity of money that you have. So you have a mediated relationship with objects and also with other people. And this brought to the uh, birth and growth of a financial system that basically operated a radical abstraction from any mode of production, any production process, to the point in which, uh, in the moment in which you buy a stock, you have no relation whatsoever with the processes that are producing that mineral, that uh, good, whatever that is. You don't need to have a relationship with it. This is where the system grows, and up to the point where we are. And I argue, I'm arguing that this is, this is the death of capitalism, actually. The death of capitalism is the enslaving of the man to, uh, to a machine that is there to execute a task that separates completely the mode of production, the process of production, from the person that is going to interact with the machine. It's a good metaphor, the mechanical Turk, it's a, it's a machine that uh, plays chess, and uh, inside is hidden a person. It even inspired a novel by Edgar Allan Poe. There are even ways to say it's in German uh, uh, that uh, might be considered racist, but they are not. In fact, they are referring to this machine. Uh, the fact that you are just enslaved and doing a repetitive work. We can recognize these roles in many of the jobs that are offered to us nowadays. Um, we function mostly as uh, um, brains, human brains, in a system that needs to mine our recognition processes, our cognitive processes, in order to, um, uh, to capitalize on them and then reuse it. And the people that will be using these con cognitive processes accumulated will be absolutely not in relationship with those that have produced them. So it became immaterial, it became delocalized, and it runs on a system, on the money system, which is completely unbalanced. I'm talking about the heavy difference between money, uh, money typologies in the world, of course. This brings us to a point that keeps war going. Because one thing that I try to do now with this discourse on biopolitics is to put life at the center, and life and body at the center. So the body of humans should be still considered the central point of all our effort 
to actually improve our living together. And the body is the point of explosion or implosion for our societies. Fundamentalism and all the, the power that fundamentalism brings is centered around bodies. The explosive body is also the implosive body of the person that gets internated into a mental institution and kills itself or tries to kill him or herself. And body is the issue also for those revolutionary types that declare sex as a revolutionary practice or porn. And the reappropriation of the body also in the liberation of economies. The last, the last thing that you have to sell if you become a prostitute and uh, the last thing that you have to curate and, and uh, let live forever if you dream, if you have that dream. So the system in which we are living arguably is a dead system because it's deleting bodies from the picture. So people have no more relationship with the bodies of the other people. This can bring to huge disasters. The analysis of Foucault on the, on the revolution of uh, Tehran against Le Shah, which was the king of, uh, of uh, Iran uh, in 77, which was forced to escape from Tehran, is about that. Fundamentalism came up. The Ayatollah Khomeini was applauded as the new ruler, entered the city in 77 after his exile, and he established a religious uh, fundamentalist regime, promising to the people that they would have had a way to handle their bodies. I mean, that's what religion buys. It tells you how to take care of your body, what to show and what not to show. It gives back to the body the actual importance that people need to have to actually build their own subjectivity as well. How to get out of fear? It's getting better, the whole thing, <laughs> from now on. Uh, there are many approaches, uh, but basically a lot of approaches are, are, are um, um, polarized around being pro or against modernism. So you can take a, a complete neg negative stance against uh, technology saying, okay, technology is the evil that makes our body disappear and blah, blah, blah. Or you can just like go for technology and be very enthusiastic about it, saying, oh, technology is just uh, accelerating our minds and making us all connected, and uh, it's wonderful. I think the gray area, again, uh, quoting Rob Honkreit from yesterday, is, is what is most interesting here, and it's the area of transition. And it's also an area in which we can develop a transversal approach to modernity, not refusing it, not embracing it completely, but try to build new forms of rationality on top of it and between. In order to do that, one of the first things that we have to take into account is the existence of the commons. We have to get out from the strained relationship between public and private. This war will never end and will actually lead nowhere. Just look at Italy right now. I mean, it has been like for 15, 20 years, just an endless war between the private power of a person that even became prime minister and the public power of the judges that want to persecute him. And it's just perpetuating this narrative to the point that people don't reach even to imagine something else if they think of a nation. This leads absolutely nowhere. There is something beyond public and private, and it's what both public and private are predating in order to exist, and it's called commons. This camp is a boiling pot of commons, and no one is allowed to actually predate them. There is no public or private sphere, really, that takes over. Yet the communication is very uh, organic. I'm talking about commons, I'm talking about uh, uh, water, mineral resources, and general sentiment, which is a buzzword also for the, um, for the financial uh, world, because general sentiment is usually uh, data mined for forecasting purposes. So you can understand what is your next uh, um, stock that is going up nowadays by data mining social networks. That's at least what they are trying to do. 
or how they can aim better advertisement to people. So actually, even the friendship, which is a common, it's being predated in this way. What can we do to take it back? First of all, I'd argue, we have also to get past from these two old categories, political categories, liberalism and socialism. Because basically, liberalism has done the error that brought us to this point. Neoliberalism, of course, accelerated and exasperated it, which is decoding everything in economical terms, which is the total abstraction, the radical abstraction in which we are. On the other side, socialism is a completely irrational thing. It doesn't have a rationality that is able to govern. It doesn't represent really a pact that can be accepted rationally and uh, a game that can be played uh, without any differences. Often it establishes relationships of privilege in the best case and of uh, uh, predomination and prevarication in the worst. Even Foucault uh, mentioned the fact that all texts about socialism that are existing are not exactly uh, establishing um, a rationality. So far, socialism uh, has been grafted into a rationality of government. That's what we call social democracy, for instance. A democracy that establishes uh, a situation in which everyone is equal, and then you graft concepts or uh, interventions that are socialist on top of it. How to do that? Well, I'd argue breaking a taboo today, since we are the internet, and uh, we are there for breaking taboos. Actually, money is a taboo. And that's the next taboo that we should break. How to do that? We can do that by engineering new forms of monetary systems. And this is an approach that, I'm, that we are taking with, uh, with many of our projects, because I think we all feel that by engineering the way and, and designing the way um, wealth is circulated is the most uh, uh, rational and honest way to actually uh, empower margins and redistribute wealth and, and have produced what we like. So I will get less theoretical now and pass it to an analysis of uh, more uh, pragmatic projects. The first is crowdsourcing, which is quite a buzz and has some limits. What I think is the biggest limit of crowdsourcing is that basically replicates uh, a modality for power to, 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 to exist again. Not just for the fact that, is, uh, that access to the biggest crowdsourcing websites is syndicated, but mostly because it doesn't create a circuit in between. There is just a flow, like a vote. There is one project and uh, another project, and people will choose which project goes on. The project will give the results that promise it, but it doesn't generate uh, an area, uh, a circuit, actually. Then we have systems like Flutter. I refer first to crowdsourcing and Flutter because they both have this positive approach of putting the community in the first row. Flutter is interesting because it tries to slide out of the old financial system, and especially it builds a circuit. So the entry point is still the old money system, but once you are inside, if you, be, if you get fluttered or you can flutter back, then you actually are into a circuit. So it starts to drift away. And it has a bottom-up approach, and it's still global and local. It can be used in both senses and it's common-centered. Now, it needs a lot of development, especially to be uh, more local, to have access, to give local access to the system, but uh, it's, uh, it's going in a nice, interesting direction. Now, my hope for this system and other systems is that they don't stop where they are, that they continue. There is one dangerous thing that happens, and uh, happened also to Bitcoin, is that the developers become stakeholders of the system, so that they are very afraid to change the system because this will break and they have a stake into the system. Don't do that. Just dare more, because this is just the beginning. So we have an innovation also coming into the picture, which is the peer-to-peer -peer crypto money approach, which brings a lot of new aspects 
into the game of uh, designing money. Here I try to resume three of those aspects that are the salient aspects, in my opinion. Well, it's digital cash, so it's, uh, uh, it can be pseudonymous. Uh, uh, well, let's say like the, the way to track money flows changes because the accounting system changes. Uh, banking becomes optional, so it breaks this complete monopoly of banks since the birth of digital currency. Since the birth of um, uh, digital systems for money, banks had a monopoly. You have to store your money into a bank, into a, cent a centralized certified body. What crypto cash does, it's very simple. You can store your digital money at home. Now, for some types, it might become very dangerous because you don't know how to keep your security. But for some other, the majority in this room, I guess, is just like an option. We have encryption, we can have uh, uh, our own storage, we can uh, duplicate it, we can uh, uh, back up it or, or not, or share keys with people. So this is a big shift also because actually the creation of a bank becomes a different business. It becomes a more accessible business. And also because it actually uh, puts the end to the monopoly of trust network. You don't actually need the same way the trust was handled before. It's not anymore. Beyond banking also for your transactions, it happens what you have with cash again which you don't have with uh, uh, current digital money systems. You don't need to trust the person you are doing the transaction. In the moment in which you need the cash flowing and you are sure that this cash is authentic, you don't need to trust more than that. The person you are selling something, you just give it back what, what the person bought. Right now you have rating systems on online services for selling stuff because you need to establish a certain trust. And the third innovation, which is the most interesting, I think, that has still to emerge, and which will put institutions, uh, currently, current tax institutions, into quite a crisis if they don't actually um, update themselves, is the triple signed receipts. Now, to make a back uh, step in time, what we are using now for uh, tax accounting and accounting system is a system called double accounting, double book accounting, which was invented in 1496 by this friar in Venice. And we are still using it. It's a simple system. You have a book of your expenses, your transactions, and then the tax uh, uh, has a book of your transactions, and these transactions get matched at the end of the year. And, uh, well, whatever is the authority with whom you share the responsibility of, this, of these uh, uh, transactions, and that's how you find out frauds. Of course, in time, we Also, people found out also how to feel link to the network of transactions. So it can be used in many ways, but basically it doesn't force you to keep the track into one central authority, but you can actually be sure and, and clear out your transactions at the end of the year, let's say of the financial year, just in a network. Of, of, of triple signed receipts. There are various systems that implement these things. One is uh, through Ledger and Loom, which is basically, in my opinion, not so interesting because it doesn't really offer, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's a way to build uh, a new uh, financial market. 
with uh, uh, this kind of uh, double blinded uh, uh, certificates. And uh, it basically provides hashes for the transaction, which is economical dial tones, QR codes, data uh, objects. And it's server based. Then there is Bitcoin, which is very interesting because it brought in uh, particular proper properties. And one of the most interesting, what I, what I consider the most interesting, is the authentication. So what Bitcoin did is bringing a, um, an energy pool, the possibility to have an energy pool for authentication. What does that mean in practice? For authenticating money nowadays, what you need is a big building with very thick walls, a secret procedure, which is an alchemical process, let's say, to actually print the money, and then armed guards on the perimeter to guard the production place. What you need with Bitcoin is just a fairly large group of people to use it to make transactions and use their CPU power to actually authenticate and the system becomes more robust and the more it's used. So it's actually pooled to all the users. Now, if we argue that Bitcoin is just like consuming electricity, we are completely underestimating the old system in which we are, which is an incredible consumption of energy in actually maintaining the places where money is printed and the authentication process that takes to print it. What is a bit upsetting uh, uh, if Bitcoin keeps on this way, in my opinion, is the fact that the Genesis code is not configurable. Bitcoin has a big potential, yet is a deflationary system, and it doesn't exactly favor the fact that you can use the same system as Bitcoin to create new coins. Now, I would argue that who says that a deflationary system in economy is uh, not really a long-standing one, is right because um, when you have such a system as Bitcoin that becomes more and more popular then people that have Bitcoins start hoarding the money because the money is worth more so they will not sell and they will not circulate anymore. It's deflationary so it won't grow anymore and people don't, are not incentivated to spend and the whole system money is a media system so it should be circulating that will be the death. You end up with an amount that you are keeping because you hope it will be worth more or less, but it's not much more than that. If we open up the Genesis code, instead we can have more deflationary systems and people can be interested actually in investing in one or another and it creates more situation that is resilient. Let's start using that word. Namecoin, Freecoin, Multicoin are things you can find uh, on uh, GitHub and uh, more to come among Gitorius. Still, it's a very immature technology. I think it needs a big deal of development, but we know this. At last, I think Open Transactions is one of the most interesting pieces of code right now out there because um, it has um, um, a lot of documentation and uh, behind the code is fairly portable, is big. Uh, fellow traveler, uh, the, the coder is very communicative and especially because it's a generic system. So it's a wallet system that works also with Bitcoin, also with True Ledger, with Loom. And uh, it needs development. It has um, a, a, a command line interface that needs a little bit of uh, uh, documentation Gnomification or whatever, and um, I think it's a good candidate actually. If you're looking for some projects to get involved and uh, and build your own with it, because it's completely free and open source and uh, GNU GPL, I think. Um, after this overview, I have the pleasure to show you at least what um, Radium who is not here, sent us, which is his part of the story. And it's quite interesting because he's with uh, his fingers in the dough. And I'm here for introducing you to Dindy's approach in currency systems design. 
And I would like to start from what the very managers of the current system have to say about the bridging, the bridging between uh, analog and digital in currency systems development. So the governor of the Bank of England, Melvin King, in his paper written in 1999, Challenges for Monetary Policy, New and Old, wondered whether it was possible that advances in technology would mean that the world may come to resemble a pure exchange economy. Indeed, electronic transactions in real time all doubt that possibility. There's no reason in principle why final settlements could not be carried out by the private sector without the need for clearing through the central bank. And Bitcoin is one good example of this. There's no conceptual obstacle to the idea that two individuals engaged in a transaction could settle by a transfer of wealth from one electronic account to another in real time. The same system could match demands and supplies of financial assets, determine prices and make settlements. Financial assets and real goods and services would in turn be priced in terms of a unit of account. Final settlement could be made without any recourse to the central bank. Without such erroneous settlements, central banks in their present form would no longer exist, nor would money. Because we are dealing with a very particular kind of money when we speak about conventional money, because this kind of money is created as banks make loans with positive interest charges. This kind of money is inflationary, is artificially kept scarce. There's no intrinsic value in the fiat money domain. Its management is vertical and follows a very strict hierarchy and the property is uh, of a semi-privately owned central banking system. So it's better, better forming by design as everybody of us can see if we look at uh, what, how the system is behaving in these very days. I mean, gold is skyrocketing uh, more than $50 per day. We have the problem of the US downgrading in its rating. We have the never-ending debt crisis, crisis in Europe, but we can say that the crisis is uh, global, actually. So what is uh, the, the approach to currency system design? Well, our approach is towards sustainable development. Indeed, in the first graph, you can see that the current financial uh, system uh, is uh, directed toward, uh, towards uh, brittleness and eventual collapse. We need to go, and we pass to the second graph uh, uh, by showing that we need to go towards uh, the parameters uh, of the window of viability by increasing diversity and interconnectivity in the system. So by adding uh, what Bernard Lita calls uh, complementary currencies, uh, what we in the Indy call alternative and community complementary currencies, and more in general monetary reform toward diversity to increase the, the interconnectivity among the parts of the system and set the system uh, toward the direction of uh, regaining uh, sustainability, overall sustainability and resilience. Our approach in doing this is to think about a global, local, a global multi-currency system. This kind of system would present uh, different types of currencies. So when one currency fails, like national currencies, we have uh, other means of payment uh, to use uh, and um, uh, to implement for making uh, the economy go and not crash as uh, the expectations for Europe and the US are currently very clear uh, orientated in that direction. How to do that? I will give you three examples of the use uh, of this uh, software program called Cyclos. It's free and open source. It offers a complete online banking system with additional modules such as uh, e-commerce. So you can set up uh, your bank and you can start trading among uh, the participants to the, the clearing network. The platform permits a decentralization of banking services. That was uh, what Marvin King uh, was saying. And the objective of the programmers was to create a professional software that was easy to use and maintain, secure and highly customizable. We at d, &D have some doubts because uh, it's actually compiled uh, 
in Java, and so Cyclos uh, could be really rewritten and be made as a better uh, and robust uh, software for banking and e-commerce. But I'm working with this and I will show you what you already can do with this kind of uh, software. The first example is the C3 commercial credit circuit. We had a problem in 2008 uh, in Uruguay. It was a global problem, but the system was uh, implemented and designed for the Uruguayan economy, whereby small and medium sites enterprises, uh, which gave uh, and give uh, employment to almost 70% uh, of the national workforce, started to experience a shortage of credit, and most of them were condemned to closure. The people of these uh, medium and sites enterprises, the entrepreneur, were paid in 90 days, but they had to pay their suppliers within 30 days. So we have these 60 days old that with um, monetary engineering uh, it'd be possible to fill. And so the system continued to run. How? You have uh, in the process, uh, the use of insured invoice instead of ma money or other payment claims. And you use them as a liquid payment instrument within this business to business clearing network round through cycles. So you have uh, the government asking uh, producers for services, they use their the secured uh, and insured invoices to buy other products from their suppliers or services to other suppliers within the C3 network. So they spend uh, insured invoices instead of money. But if you are a producer and you need uh, to cash the invoice before they reach maturity, then you can go to the bank and cash them by paying uh, a high banking fee because the bank will incur interest cost by making you cash the invoice before the maturity period uh, has passed. So you are incentivized in uh, continuing to trade uh, with your invoices uh, inside the network and wait uh, for these invoices uh, to be mature. What are the advantages of this kind of uh, banking engineering system? It's a win-win for all situation because workers do not lose their job. Businesses do not close uh, whilst possibly they enhance their turnover. Banks increase their portfolio by uh, this insurance mechanism and they have a low risk uh, and cheap uh, insurance instrument indeed. And also governmental agencies who accept the C3 currency increase their income in terms uh, of tax revenue. What are another example uh, that at Dindi we are working on, uh, making the cultural credit circuit, uh, which is uh, the, the C3 version for the cultural sector. So if you have the problem that uh, public funds are lacking, then you can simply trade with a payment medium different uh, from the conventional one and uh, you use the same kind uh, of scheme that I was proposing here. So instead of uh, commercial credit, you do cultural credit. You have the same choices. You can go to the bank and cash the cultures uh, by paying uh, the banking fee to cover the interest costs. Otherwise, you can keep the cultures uh, until maturity and cash them with no banking fees. Or otherwise, you can continue make them circulate in the cultural credit network. In so doing, you're going to increase uh, the aggregate turnover inside that uh, economic uh, circle, economic network. The third example is a project uh, onto which I'm working presently, where I'm based here in Portugal, and this is the motivation why I was not present personally in doing my presentation at uh, Cows Communication Camp. I am trying to use a cycle of, so for building up uh, an instrument like the C3, but uh, especially designed uh, to work uh, in a counter cyclical way so against the crisis. I call this project uh, our bank. And uh, what our bank is meant to do. We have the structural problem 
uh, in Portugal and in the whole Euro area, but the Portuguese austeridad measures will be as follows. Portugal has accepted uh, seven, 78 billion euros uh, from uh, the IMF or the European Fund for Financial Stability or the European Central Bank. Somebody will put this money made together to save the country from default. And uh, by doing this, uh, it's already been measured that between uh, 2011 and 2012, we will have a GDP contraction of about 4%. Consuming will fall uh, of about 8.2% and uh, the purchasing power of the euro will lose 5.4% uh, in these two years left. What is the solution? Well, we started uh, thinking that the property of money is not ours. Everybody knows that the European Central Bank is the legal owner. But we can decide how to use this money to our own advantage by implementing the free open source software. So it's very cheap, but very secure and transparent and very helpful for contrasting the austerity measure. Because we can imply certain conditions for digital money in order to make it work better for the country, in this case Portugal, but the, the plan is to go European, so also in Spain, Greece, Ireland, uh, now Italy is coming, maybe France, uh, rumors are going on in these days, it's very hard to understand who will need this, but a lot of countries will need this. Even why nominally this money is still expressed in Europe. So the solution is to increase the purchasing power, power of uh, our euros with uh, our bank system of payments, so where it is operating uh, a bonus models mechanism run with uh, flows cycles. How? Well, within the virtual payment network of our, our bank, uh, euros can be designed to behave differently and to circulate within one specific market and empower the, that economy, in this case, the Portuguese national economy. So if you put 100 euros uh, in a bank account at our bank, you will automatically gain a 5% bonus and you can spend it uh, into the network of uh, businesses that are providing goods and services and uh, are willing to participate into the network. If you want to spend out of the network by using the money that you put in our bank bank account, then uh, you will be fined a 6% uh, on the value of your transaction and this is an incentive for you to spend within the network. What would happen with this? It's like uh, devaluing uh, the currency as uh, Portuguese were used to do with all the scudos, but you're using actually euros and you're building up a virtual network uh, with cyclos, whereby you can start to trade uh, with this bonus miles mechanism, whose main effect will be to compensate this previous 5% loss in purchasing power I was speaking about. So in these two years, the Portuguese people will experience no loss in purchasing power because of the bonds model mechanism. So in conclusion, I would stress that um, possibilities with uh, open source software and uh, money system design are infinite. At Dindy, we are trying to work uh, in the most uh, urgent domains, uh, which are those uh, more, more affected by the financial crisis, at different levels. So it can be a place like Uruguay, which is more or less a developing country, or it's not so important as advanced economies, but you can also act uh, here where the crisis is hitting most, uh, so in the south of Europe uh, presently, with uh, this kind of uh, system that uh, will help people actually to go against the austerity measures. And so in general, Dindy's approach in currency system design uh, is stressing the importance of open source software, technologies like and algorithms like those developed uh, by the Bitcoin crew. You will also see what Jeremy has to say in this particular domain. And uh, we invite you to think about uh, what your knowledge can contribute uh, in uh, solving this mayhem that uh, 
the financial crisis is impelling on all of us. I hope to have been clear and I thank you for your attention. I wish you a great, great, great time at the camp. Goodbye from radio. Uh, all his love is really sorry that he couldn't come. Um, to conclude uh, and open up to uh, q and A is um, very important that you make the next step and you make the connection. Whoever is inspired that is looking at this, it's we are putting on the table some thoughts and some actions, but there is a lot to be done. And already you see the distance between this first philosophical reflections with which we started this, uh, this, this talk and then the field work. And you can imagine what Marco, what uh, Radium is doing is really being on the field uh, there uh, in Portugal and connecting and, and telling people that there is a possibility to actually you know, make your own money and exit the system. So if you're really critical, then you can uh, uh, build the complementary or even alternative circuits. So it's, it's a matter of uh, what some philosophers know what they call even exodus. So if you are um, critical of a system, why should you use still that uh, media? You can change the media channels. We have a very uh, good experience on that. In the moment in which you try to do it, the real tough um, challenge is that of binding it with these dynamics that we mentioned, with, with the production of, of, of the, the values and with, with, with the dynamics that produce the values, with the bodies that produce the values, to let people feel people, and especially with the commons. There are some books somewhere quoted. One is Commonwealth, which is very interesting, came out last year. It's the last one of the trilogy of Negri and Art, which explores the notion of the commons. And another one I have here that uh, was an entertaining read, especially for, for us from the digital world, which is Andre Gortz, L'Immateriale. But the one that I like the most about all these topics and that teach me most is this book that is almost not printed anymore, and it's almost, uh, yeah, I, I, I really, it was hard to find a copy, by Christian Marazzi, who is also getting well known now. And this is uh, one of his old books, and it's called Il Posto dei Calzini in Italian, which means the place of the socks. And the metaphor is this. In your life, the person that puts the socks in your drawer is the one that loves you the most, yet is the one that is less paid in this whole game of the economy. Thank you. Okay, you know the drill. If you have questions, please queue up at the microphone. Uh, well, yeah, I can come to you, but I don't particularly like to. <laughs> so, uh, you mentioned earlier uh, that um, socialism wasn't rational. I wonder if you could perhaps uh, uh, elaborate on that? Yeah. Well, of course, it's an argument that can be debated and could be very interesting to debate it. Myself, I changed my idea many times, like why don't we implement the socialism that Foucault mentions has still to be implemented or not? I think the challenge is open and I might be wrong. But what doesn't seem rational is the fact that every time you have um, a planning for the social, you give the privilege to the planners. And this is the loss that uh, uh, socialism has to liberalism, because theoretically, theoretically, in liberalism there is no planner, there is a game. And everyone plays that game, but there is no privilege, so... The audio to the microphone to the center, thank you. Okay. Yeah. 
So, um, I, I think you had a very interesting talk, and I found yeah. it especially. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. And I found it especially fascinating how you um, came to the to the sub currencies, for example, for the Portuguese market. Yeah. Um, but you uh, try to you try to connect them to your notions of the body and the commons, which you um, introduced in your philosophical part. And I have a huge problems with these two notions. I have the feeling that you that you didn't define them properly, or at least not in this presentation. Mm. For once, you say um, that outside this area there is uh, there are the commons, where I see uh, a difference between public, the streets, private, the tents. Public, the tents, private, the sleeping bag. I don't see the commons there. There might be some things which are less public and things with, uh, than in the normal life, but still there is this difference. And uh, even more so for the body, you try to, um, you try to, or you say that we should uh, make a system around the body, but the body is one of the most difficult concepts to define. If I make music, does this still count to the body, or is this music external to the body? Is the body my skin? Is the model? It's. I mean, it's. It's a very interesting thought. But if you cannot put it in, in a clearer words, then you cannot convince me. Mm. Well, um, it definitely, it's a constraint to have a 60 minutes talk about these things, and it definitely, it's a constraint to have a stage which, as you see, I start just feeling like jumping off. And um, I still believe that um, there, is, there are commons here. And these commons are, for instance, uh, the, 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 even the will to show or, or to interact with the first person that asks you about your project, about your ideas. You're not selling them. You're not uh, um, asking to sign up to any Creative Commons license before starting to talk. There is no one enforcing a copyright on the things that are shared here, or a copyleft, or whatever. You're just sharing them. So this very organic, natural attitude of sharing ideas on the material level, I call Commons here. Um, because it's something that stays in the community let's say, that flows through. Or I, I know it's not a good definition. Regarding the body in music, uh, w when he was telling me like what is the body, I, I was just thinking about the dancers. Uh, and, and of course also the, the, the fingers and, and, the, and the breath of, of the players. And uh, it has, it has uh, yeah, uh, I can't say more than that. Thank you for your criticism. <laughs> uh, just a note, the mic is movable. You don't need to crouch. Yeah. Um, in one of the first slides, uh, there was a quote on the unimportance of scale and that it was more the perspective that, that was important. But still, I was wondering about the scalability of these systems and how these different uh, well, currency types, like the, the digital coins or the C3, how they interact or connect through different exchanges as a distributed economy, for instance, on the, lo on the local or yeah. uh, regional, national, global level. So I'm wondering what your, your idea about this type of scalability is. Thank you for the question, Rimmer, because I forgot to mention one word in this speech, and it's rezone. So if you think of the rezone as defined in the book that I quoted at the beginning, actually not. That was Antioedipus. In another book by Deleuze and Guattari, which is Mil Plateau, uh, A Thousand Plains, I think it's translated in English, they define this quite hyped image of a rezone. So in the rezone, there is not really a scaling, and you can see it almost as a fractal, uh, a fractal uh, system. So there is no scale because when we imagine a monetary system in this case, we imagine it as replicable and then interconnected. And, and the, the square that, uh, that uh, Radium was showing, the, the four squares interconnected, you can imagine they, they form a square which interconnects another 
four squares. It grows like a Sierpinski pattern. So the, the vision is that of not just taking care that a system can scale because we can apply the same system everywhere or the same value everywhere, but is that we can actually share the production means for uh, circulating values in different, uh, in different contexts and then allow them to, to share again. One thing that is uh, also important to, to mention is that we want to get out from the national um, uh, kind of uh, uh, delimitation because it's absol absolutely obsolete uh, nowadays. We, I mean, the boundaries of our value and communities are very different and they don't match just like a line traced uh, by, by Napoleon and whoever came after. Yeah, I, can, I can imagine a, a, some local uh, community exchanging with a community on the other side of the world or yeah. where with a higher level like a, some other national, national exchange or a, tra uh, a translateral exchange between these different currency types and communities. Yeah. yeah. And empower them to actually join the game in a way that yeah. they have a standing point, a media. But then opposed to that, you have what, what you mentioned at the end, the uh, exodus type groups that want to step out of these systems completely, yeah. basically, and their exchange will be purely within goods uh, opposed to monetary systems. Which you can still do, you should be able to yeah, do. Yeah, exactly. But is, is that also what you meant with these exodus? They want to uh, yeah, have this exodus from the monetary system and have uh, exchange purely with goods and well services apart from exchanging through uh, a monetary system it's it's a very problematic uh, word access mm. if discussed like this because uh, we don't have enough time there is a lot beyond beyond this word behind this word and uh, it's it's a matter of constituency when you constitute yourself it means that you're not forced to interact with someone or to respond to someone, but you're just like constituting yourself as a community and then you can also decide to leave. And uh, yeah, well, this, this, the, the potency for this to happen is into the, 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 the fact that you can produce the same conditions on a smaller scale or a larger scale, so to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, thank you. Very interesting. I would have uh, a big amount of questions, of course, but uh, I choose one. Yeah. Which is, uh, um, did you explore uh, the which are, which is the situation about uh, uh, the laws? Because uh, of course, creating alternative currencies, new monetary systems is a, a, a big challenge and uh, if we look also back in the history in the 30s for example now we had another period of experimentations and invention of uh, new currencies and at the end they mostly have been repressed then also the monetary system changed but uh, anyway what is the situation today and how you yeah. think to address uh, yeah. this problem well it makes sense to ask this question definitely and I take a, a easy escape route, the one of the philosopher. Uh, the digital, uh, the digital I process is an immanent process. And as such, it means that to influence this reality, uh, that reality likes it or not. That there is a law or not, the, the present systems have to deal with what the digital world brings to them. And this is clear in the, in the, in the copyright laws as they have been taught for the analog world so far and the digital world as coming. This immanent process is a problematic one, of course, but it's unstoppable. So I think that uh, the, the process in which we are, uh, to which we are looking, the process of money and, 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 the, and the progress of money into the digital world, thanks also to discoveries, to, to cryptography, for instance, and, and, and uh, artifacts of the digital world, um, it is an immanent process. So I think that when I speak here, I'm not really interested in, in, uh, in caring about the laws that might stop or not, because um, 
those who write code write also the laws somehow. And there is a negotiation there, but definitely if we are up to imagine a system, the first thing that we should look at are the philosophical principles and, 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 and all the background of political science and, and all the history of go governmentality uh, that, uh, that has been written so far, rather than to the laws that allow us to do something or not in this very moment. Because what we are talking about is going to change the laws, definitely. They have to adapt to what is going to happen. And they cannot claim that they have a system that are, is under control because this system, the current economical system, the current financial system is not under control, is not under control of the laws either. So it actually survives out of the existence of crime. It survives out of, of, of the criminalization of drug traffic by making it existing or, or prostitution or all the great zones. It survives out of, of the existing of, of uh, tax havens like Isle of Man or whatever, you name it. So uh, there is no uh, real argument uh, uh, right now that would include laws in an interesting way for me. Okay, we have a question from uh, Sven yeah. um, in Berlin ah, okay. from the ISC channel about the technical feasibility uh, of dig digital currencies. And um, the question is, or the assumption is that we are missing the hardware to hold and exchange the digital values we have. And that the acceptance of the, this new currency uh, only works with computers and internet to exchange. And um, the system right now isn't really resilient. Do you have any thoughts about this? Yes, lots of good questions. I've been warned. Um, this is the challenge. When, when uh, uh, Radium gives you the example of what he's working on now, he's facing it and he's there. That's why he cannot be here day by day and talking to people and try to uh, realize how to make it accessible. And uh, all these things also go down without the electricity, we know. I mean, we are busy with resiliency. And I think the resilient conspiracy should be really like a, a, a motto out of this uh, uh, camp. So, but anyway, how to um, actually continue existing out of the digital, that is an interesting field. I think one of the most interesting innovations right now are QR codes. So something that you can print and rescan, it can stay without need for energy and it can be circulated. All the potential given to digital money by QR code has not been yet uh, uh, used, it has not been yet. Uh, so that is just an example. Anything that represents a gateway between a reliable gateway between the digital and the analog because we have to see it like this, that's the QR code, is a gateway, it's a very agile gateway in a way. Everything that uh, emerges in technology as such, as such a gateway, then it will be the, the key answer to this. Um, at last, an example, a person that has never been used, uh, used to uh, click on a computer or talking uh, about these things, if this person just knows that your bank account can be uh, erogating can give, be giving you money out of your printer at home and that you print this money to go shopping and that you cover the QR code until you are shopping because in the moment in which you show it you are giving the money this person even if he has never used a computer just for printing will be able to use this system I think it can be explained hide this thing it's a bit of a magic and or people that are are told that on their, on their phone they have this banking system they can generate money. Simple app. I want to give like 10 uh, uh, dindies to someone. Um, I make it appear. I leave the phone here. You put the phone on top. Even if it's inefficient, it's a QR code scanning. There is this magic moment of recognition and plop, the money is given. It even looks cool, you know, you can even look it, use it in, in kind of underground transactions. Or kind of, so. Okay, we have a very patient question yeah. over there. Please. Um, yeah, first I want to address the, um, the um, why the um, current understanding of uh, socialism and capitalism I think is bullshit. 
And I think it's simply because they are war for war for wars fought for it, and you can't fight wars or um, legitimate violence by an, um, by an valid society concept. Um, so the yeah. other thing was um, a concept a concept that I didn't. Uh, so much work on, but I found find very interesting. It's a directly um, energy-based currency, so not like Bitcoin. It's basically spent and cannot really um, be brought back. But instead, you really exchange uh, energy in what form ever. Um, would be a really interesting um, thing, also because. Um, well, you can't um, you can't print energy. Energy is preserved. It's perfect, uh, non-inflationary. Um, but also, um, you can um, you can uh, measure things in energy and um, see how that correlates to the price. And I think that would be uh, mm. very um, interesting to see what energy is actually going in there and what the prices so and the last thing um, maybe some of you may heard of open flatter and actually I'm the person who started it but I'm not a um, developer or um, programmer in any way I'm just a graphics person who think that should be started and so if you are interested in such things, please um, let me know. Thank you. I, I was also emotional when I, when I started, I'm still, when I started this speech, so I understand. Um, open flutter, you say. So your, your point is also to make uh, uh, open source the code behind uh, flutter, which is a very... Um, make... Um, uh, hopefully distributed uh, way yeah. of the Flatter principle. Well, you beat me on that because that's the approach and that's the spirit. As uh, Rob said yesterday, we should be really worried of how technology is being developed today because everything is getting centralized and centralized. As much as I trust the folks at Flutter, as much you are right in saying that it should be decentralized. Um, you know, good old systems like the SMTP, they became popularly used just because they are decentralized. Also the new systems that we use, especially for these important things, they should be open and decentralized. I will answer your questions um, uh, backwards. The second one was about how do we measure the energy that is, uh, if, I, if I understood well, the energy that uh, is transforming. I mean, how do we measure the transformation of energy between the commons? Um, maybe money is not the right way to do it, but then I like to keep it a very open, um, an open perspective. That one, I'm, I'm not sure how do we, uh, how can we measure between different typologies of commons? It's maybe it's bad to to put them in relation. And the first point, uh, which we can use to also conclude, is is actually a very important one which I didn't mention much, but is war. And war is one of the main reasons why myself, I want to just get out of the present system. It's unbearable, and we cannot be part of a system that proposes war as the only alternative, only thing to be supported anyway, because that's how finance survives. I like one of the last sentences of, I think is Andre Gortz, that, no, it's Christian Marazzi, that it's strange to be said, but it's just the systemic uh, capacity, the systemic uh, ability to avoid a financial crisis of planetary dimensions that lets, lets us explain the presence of war and to produce capital using life we must remember how much life 
how, how much, how, how little life counts for the power in, in charge right now. So I think as much as to, to, to go from scale to scale, as much as uh, uh, racism, the origin of racism, is basically the hate that people have for their own condition that they project on the diversity that they have in front, as much as our system is actually uh, exacerbating its own condition by perpetuating uh, a constant war to the outside. Yeah, so oh, thank you. Okay, I'm going to cut you off here, even though no talk is coming in this uh, shelter you know, anymore. But I have an, oh, yeah, a short question. I, I think I have a last uh, comment on the digital currency stuff. Yep. Uh, Sven thinks that it would be fun to store digital money on changing the atoms on coins to hold the information. Then we, choose, as then we can use the old atom money for the new digital money. And it would be fun if you fi find a coin uh, to decide is it a real money or is it digital money. That's cool. Okay, That's but, uh, very transversal approach, actually. I do have an announcement to make, and everybody who left early, they have uh, their loss. At one o'clock in the morning, that is in about uh, one hour and uh, 30 minutes, there will be a surprise movie showing in Kourou, that's the other shelter, after the last uh, talk over there. So um, I think you might want to watch that. I don't even know myself what it will be. Also, the feedback system is now enabled, so if you watch this talk or any other talk, please go to the uh, schedule, which is linked from the uh, CAM website. There you can look at the pages of the individual events and give feedback. There will be a highly visible blue box that you can click and give feedback, and it's very helpful for, to the organizers and also for the speaker who will be able to see the anonymized uh, feedback for his talk. And lastly, when you leave, please look under your chairs and take all your thrash with you. Extra karma if you take somebody else's thrash. So please give a last applause for our speaker and uh, good evening. <laughs>